Hi, I'm Mike Reeves, and today I want to listen with you to one of those lesser known but by no means less great parts of the Bible. It's Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 16. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Now, Song of Songs, while it used to be widely read as a book, people rather ignore it today, and I sense that's because people think it's just a romance. It's there in the Bible to say, hey, romance is okay, which is a fine point, but it's slightly limited, hence people move on. But I think there is way more going on in the song. It's the story of a lady who's in love with the king. And no ordinary king. This king is a shepherd. A shepherd king? Sound familiar? Well, just listen to this description of the king as he arrives for his wedding. It's Song of Songs, chapter 3, verse 6. Here's the king arriving for his wedding. And we look and we say, What is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense? So the king arrives like a column of smoke from the wilderness. A column of smoke from the wilderness? Sound familiar? Ring any bells? It's the Lord in the wilderness leading his people through the wilderness in the Exodus. Exodus 13, 21, the Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud, a column of smoke to lead them along the way, and by night in a column of fire. So who is the king arriving for the wedding now? The Lord. And it's not just that he's wearing cologne. He's gone for a very weird myrrh-frankincense combination. Now, these are things most guys would not normally wear to a wedding. Myrrh was what you used to make the holy anointing oil to consecrate the high priest in the temple in the Old Testament. Myrrh was what you used to prepare bodies for burial. It was when Jesus was buried, they wrapped his body with myrrh. And frankincense? That's what you use in the sacred incense that they would use and burn in the temple. So the king arrives for his wedding day smelling like a dead high priest waving incense. And the girl in the song? Well, she keeps being compared to a vineyard. Now, when you see that Israel, the Lord's bride, throughout the Old Testament keeps being compared to a vineyard, well, it starts looking inescapable. The king, who is the shepherd, who is the Lord, who is the high priest, who dies, who wins a bride, who, by the way, is like a vineyard. This is Christ in the church. And I've only given you a few verses. And the more I read the song, the more verses seem to scream at me that I should read it in the traditional way, that this is no ordinary romance. This is about the romance between Christ and his bride, his people, the church. And so the song is all about union with Christ, that loving union that Christ has with his bride. And when you see that, then our little verse, chapter 2, verse 16, starts to throb with gospel goodness and lessons for us. Because in a few short words, it sums up the whole story of the gospel, which is the story of King Jesus coming to claim his bride. Now, do you know the story? Well, you certainly know how a wedding works. In the wedding service, the bride says to the groom, all that I am I give to you, and all that I have I share with you. And the groom says exactly the same thing to his bride. All that I am, I give to you. All that I have, I share with you. But in this case, the bridegroom is the king. And so with those words, this ordinary girl becomes the queen. My beloved is mine, 
and I am his. And so as she gives him all that is hers, he gives her all that is his. And repeatedly through the Bible, have a look at Ephesians 5 in your own time later, we are told that the people of God, the church, we are the bride of Christ. And that is our happy story. When we heard Christ's call, will you love, cherish and obey me? And we simply said, in our hearts, I will. Then we enjoyed the great marriage swap. Christ took all that was ours. He took our sin, our debt, our judgment. And we got all that is his. His righteousness, glory, life, salvation. So, becoming a Christian means Christ wears your crown, the crown of thorns. You wear his crown, the crown of glory. He puts on the filthy rags of your sin, your shame, and you put on his royal robes of life and blessing and honour. My beloved is mine, and I am his. And remember, how did this girl get all this blessing? She couldn't make herself a bit more wifish by helping lots of grannies cross roads and going to lots of prayer meetings. No. Only when the king says, I take you to be my wife, is she his. Just so. We only get all the blessing by simple acceptance. I will. It's always good to remember that marriage story at the heart of the gospel. For it means so much. First, it means I shouldn't base my confidence before God on my behaviour. Because having sinful behaviour is something different to having a righteous status. When the great reformer Martin Luther read our verse... He said it means the sinner can confidently display her sins in the face of death and hell and say, if I have sinned, yet my Christ in whom I believe has not sinned, and all his is mine, and all mine is his. Do you see then the happy boldness that this can give us, understanding this marriage story and the marriage swap Elsewhere, Luther put it like this. He said, When the devil throws up our sins at us and declares that we deserve death and hell, we ought to speak thus. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? Does this mean I shall merit eternal damnation? By no means. For I know one who has made satisfaction and suffered in my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ. And where he is, there I shall be also. What boldness, what happy confidence this can give us. But you know, we get even more from our little verse. Notice how the girl speaks to the king. She says of him, my beloved is mine and I am his, my beloved. Now, it's quite something getting married to the king. I mean, think of all the stuff she gets. She gets gold, power, servants. But in the song, the girl never really seems interested in those things. What's she interested in the song? Well, read through it. I recommend in your own time later. What is she interested in? With great delight, she says in chapter 2, verse 3, with great delight, I just sat in his shadow. She just loves being with him. Chapter 2, verse 8, now feel the tingle as she says this. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes. My beloved is mine and I am his. It's so obvious, isn't it? 
What is it that she gets? What is it that she wants from a relationship with him? With all her heart, him. The benefit of union with Christ is Christ. Now, that is so obvious, and yet getting that changes everything. Think about it. What happens when you get that the benefit of being a Christian is Christ? Well, perhaps let's put it the other way around. What happens when you forget that the benefit of being a Christian is Christ? And boy, how often does that happen? Well, what does the gospel become if something else is the real benefit of being a Christian? What does the gospel become? Little more than eternal fire insurance. And then, rather than entering a loving relationship with Christ, we use him as our sordid little get-out-of-hell-free card. If we merely get some salvation from Christ, but don't think that salvation is to know and enjoy him, we are using Christ for our own ends. Christ buys us heaven, thanks Jesus, you can go now. And you know, I think way too often Christian evangelism is horribly tainted by this. You hear, you're a sinner, so God will punish you, but few Jesus takes the punishment, so now you can get heaven. So I may feel grateful, but I don't necessarily love Christ at all. In fact, I probably still just love myself, and I'm just glad that he's got heaven for me and not hell. And way too often I think I'm seeing Christian lives wrecked by this. When I see wearied, joyless Christians... I just wonder if this could be the issue. You see, they're living as if Christianity is all about, well, not enjoying a relationship with him. Possibly it's about something like having been rescued from hell and simply trying to drag as many people out with you. Not much fun. When in truth, being a Christian is about enjoying Christ and letting others in to enjoy him too. The gospel is not some deal to buy us stuff. Now, how much we are rescued from, how much we are given, but the gospel is about entering a loving relationship with a living God. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He gives us all that is his. He gives us himself.